Okay, 18.2, Bird Systems. Uh, the first part, our system we want to talk about. Yes. Um, it is a digestive system. If you kind of think about the life that God's made for birds, and since they depend pretty heavily on flight, uh, they need, they're, they're going to have a high energy demand. Now, some birds have a lot higher energy demand than others. If you kind of think about the hummingbird and how it flies, um, it requires a lot of energy to fly like that. And so hummingbirds will probably eat almost their, uh, their weight or maybe more in, in a day just to be able to maintain that high energy uh, life that God's created for them. So they need to have a digestion that's going to be pretty rapid. Now, if they're not a flying bird, it's not as important that it be rapid, but birds that do fly, it needs to be, be able to pass through their system quickly. Um, a berry can pass through a bird's digestive system in 30 minutes. Whereas when you eat, the food that you eat at lunch today will probably pass out of your system tomorrow sometime. So it, it'll be there, you know, like, it'll take like 24 hours to pass through. It kind of depends on, on, on a number of different things, but it, it would uh, pass through a lot longer than that. So a bird needs to get rid of this extra weight for flight and to get the energy as quickly as possible. Um, does the system say one, four, and six, or one, four, and eight? Where? Uh, for the sign for today, for 18.2, say six or eight. One, four, six, eight. and one, three, four. Okay, so in, if you're looking at the digestive system of a bird, when they eat, let's say seeds, for instance, the seeds will go down into a crop that they have. It's kind of like right here on their body. And the fuller it is, it kind of, kind of swells out a little bit if they've if eaten uh, a lot of seeds. Uh, but remember, birds don't have teeth to chew it. So we need to have something in the digestive system that will break up like these seeds into small little pieces to make them more digestible. So they have a gizzard. And birds, a lot of birds will pick up little tiny stones and, uh, and swallow them as well. If you uh, raise chickens, you have to give them some, something to replace that so that they can, so it'll go down in the gizzard and. It, as the muscles of the gizzard uh, move it back and forth, these sharp pieces break up the seeds uh, to make them more digestible. Then they will pass into the intestine where that will be digested. Uh, and then it will uh, be stored in here when they're done. And then they have one single opening, remember we said, where the Urinary, urinary bladder empties out through there, the solid waste goes through there, and uh, the female lays its eggs there as well. So they have, you know, they use one opening for a, a, a bunch of different things. Uh, when we look at the bills that they have, you know, we uh, think one of the extra credit ones, the long slender bills, you know, they're for spearing fish or plucking insects out of cracks, you know, where they can reach in there and pull out uh, an insect. We have the short start stout bills that are for cracking and crushing seeds. The, the long bills don't work good for that. They need a short one. And the beaks are a lot more broad up and down this way. If you're looking at it from the side, they're broad this way uh, to make them stronger to be able to, to crush the seeds. We have those with the hook pointed bills for tearing flesh off of, uh, you know, like a, an animal that they've caught. They're usually for carnivores. Then we have bills that are sieves, like flamingos, stick their head underwater and kind of 
move them around in the water to kind of filter out stuff that's floating in the water. Um, and then we have the long slender bills that have a tongue in it for uh, gathering nectar from flowers. Uh, so that'd be like the hummingbird, for instance. So each beak is, uh, is unique to the diet of that bird. So you're not gonna feed, you know, like, hummingbirds, you know, don't eat meat. You know, they, that would not, they, God didn't provide them with a bill that would, uh, that would make that very useful. As far as a respiration is concerned, remember we talked about birds have lungs, but their oxygen demands are pretty high so they'd either have to have an awful big chest, which would make for air resistance, uh, or God provided them with additional air sacs in addition to the lungs to help them with respiration. So inside the body are these, these extra air sacs. Um, And they have a voice box for making sounds. Uh, each, each kind of bird has its own unique sound that it makes, and we often recognize what bird it is. If I said a cardinal, many of you know what the sound of a cardinal is, because it's, it's a common bird in our area, and uh, sparrows kind of have their own little sound. It's a, Sparrows are really like, are in the finch family. They're, they're called house finches. Uh, it's, it's the right name for a sparrow. They're actually just a kind of finch. Uh, if I remember right, the finches, the house sparrows, actually originated in Europe, probably England, and they came along with the ships. They would ride along with the ships. Um, and um, a few of those got to America. They are all the sparrows we have right now. Uh, so they came from that. Okay, circulation, they have a four-chambered heart, so it's a very efficient system. The, the bottom chamber, there's a right ventricle, a left ventricle, and they have this septum in the, in the middle, which is muscular to help squeeze the blood, and it's very effective in pumping the blood around. Because of that center divider, they have oxygenated blood that's coming from the lungs, so this would be the vessel that's bringing blood back from the lungs uh, to the, this ventricle, and then from there it would go out to all parts of the body. So it keeps the oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood separate from each other, so which would make them more efficient. And they, they uh, will, you know, they need to be able to fly for long periods of time. There are some birds that when they migrate. Uh, they'll, they'll usually congregate along the Gulf Coast of like Texas and, and uh, maybe Mississippi and Louisiana. And they'll s spend a little time there feeding and, you know, building up their energy supplies. Because when they take off from, uh, that would be East Texas or the Gulf Coast, they will not touch down again until they reach South America. They'll fly for hours, many hours, like you know, days. They're just constantly flying. There's no, there's no landing. You know, there's no place to land. And they, but it, just imagine that you're carrying enough energy along. And uh, they've actually, I remember when I studied ornithology, they've taken some of these birds and uh, weighed them, and then they would put a, well, they probably put the, the. Uh, a little band on their on their legs, you know, to identify the bird and weigh them, and then turn them loose. And then, uh, when they get to South America, they catch them again and weigh them. And it's amazing how little weight they have lost in that way. They are very efficient little flyers, and they, but they just fly, and they don't fly all that fast. They're only flying maybe 30, 35 miles an hour, you know, like slower than what the speed limit is out here in Fort Crook. And they just fly for hours and hours and hours on end until uh, they get to South America. And they don't lose many along the way. Uh, but they have incredible heart rates. 
the bigger birds have the smaller heart rates or the lower heart rates. The tinier birds, like the, the hummingbirds, will have very high. When you think about 570 beats a minute, your heart rate probably right now while you're sitting there is probably around 60, 70 maybe. You know, look at how many times faster that is. You know, that's like eight times faster than what yours is right now if you're a hummingbird. Excretion, this is getting rid of liquid waste out of the blood. They have kidneys. Uh, kidneys are located in the back along the spinal, spinal column. They're protected much the same way as ours. Ours are back right here on, on, on us. And uh, the kidney then empties straight into the cloaca. There is no bladder in between, okay? There is no bladder. So the solid waste and the liquid waste mix all together, and that's the reason why when you see uh, bird droppings, they're pretty runny because it's a mixture of both of those. If you've ever been in, in a building where <coughs> pigeons above you have uh, dropped on you. Remember that happening when we were visiting my aunt and uncle up in Minnesota. I was sitting there wait, watching them milk the cows and all of a sudden something landed on my head. Touched it and it was all runny. Like a pigeon up there would. So, they, but they have no bladder. Okay, as far as response, um, they have vision is usually quite important for birds to navigate uh, and maneuver through. I mean, if you've ever watched male birds uh, during mating season and they're trying to avoid being attacked by another male and they're constantly swooping around through trees and they don't run into anything, you know, so they have, must have fantastic eyesight and fantastic ability to maneuver around all those branches. But eagles, you know, the birds of prey, rely very heavily on their ability to see a tiny little creature on the ground. Their eyesight's way better than ours. They can see things, small things, from a much greater distance than we can. Uh, then we have those that require, that depend on hearing. You know, uh, Owls have very big eyes because their eyesight needs to be good at night. You know, so they have to be able to see better than we can at night. Uh, and, but they have good hearing. They can hear a little mouse, let's say, crawling through the grass. To us, we hear absolutely nothing. But to them, they can hear it. And they can you know, like pinpoint where that little mouse is going through the grass and start tracking in on where that mouse is to swoop in and get it. So here are the parts of the brain. We'll cover that a little bit later on a slide. But remember the olfactory lobes have to do with what? Smell. Okay. Smell is important but not hugely important because you can see about what portion of the brain. They have a cerebrum, that's where voluntary uh, or muscle motion, voluntary muscle motion, and they have a fair amount of intelligence. Uh, I think I told you the story about that one bird that found that golf ball and kept smacking it into the pavement and watching it you know, I'm not sure that, you know, I'm, I'm sure it was something he'd learned to do with maybe clams or oysters or snails or something like that, and then found out, you know, this is, this, this is some good entertainment here, uh, you know, bouncing this golf ball around. That's, you know, birds are often, uh, they, they can be kind of a nuisance on the golf course. You know, they, they see this thing roll up there, and then they'll go snag it, and they'll take off with it, and, I don't know how you score it in golf when you, when the bird flies off with your ball, but, okay, optic lobes has to do with what? If you go to the optical department, you're going for what? Yeah, you want to get glasses or contacts. 
Okay, so the C. C is really important for birds. Uh, cerebellum, that's the coordination. Coordination is very important for a bird, isn't it? Uh, little baby birds don't have a whole lot of that at first, but by the time they're an adult, they're very efficient flyers. Okay, so uh, as far as bird reproduction, courtship is a very important part in the reproduction part. It, uh, it kind of like prepares the, the male and the female for that, uh, for making new little ones. So the male is usually, uh, as we've talked about before, it's quite often brightly colored and the female is a lot more drab colored and she kind of blends into the, into the surroundings, makes it a lot more suitable for protecting her nest or something like that. Now, um, at, uh, with courtship, by the way, with birds, uh, some birds, when they uh, mate for the very first time, their mate will be their mate for life. There are others that the mate will only be for that year. And then they migrate and then they come back, you know, they have to find a new mate. Uh, so it just depends on what, how God has designed them as to, you know, how long it will last. Uh, some birds, uh, when they, after mating, uh, you know, they, they lay their eggs. We call it oviparous because they lay eggs. And then they uh, usefully have to uh, nest on them to keep them warm. Uh, how many eggs they produce kind of depends on the bird. Uh, the bigger the bird, usually the fewer the eggs they lay. And then the smaller ones will have a lot of them because maybe their chance of survival are not very good. It seems seem like the animals that have the least chance of survival, either because they're food for other animals or it, it's just a hard life, uh, they usually produce plenty. You know, and those that are don't have many predators don't have to produce as many. You know, God designed them well. We don't want to don't want to have too many of these, so we'll have fewer of these. Um, but their egg is remember we talked about an amniotic egg. Uh, there's the amnion right there. This is the little embryo that's going to be growing. This is the yolk. That's the the yellow part of the egg. And then this is the, this albumin up here. That's the white part of the egg after you've cooked it. It's clear before you cook it, right? If you ever like fried an egg, you know the, it's the clear part around the yolk is is this albumin part. Okay, uh, internal fertilization is that. In other words, when the mother bird makes the egg. Before it puts the shell on it, it needs to be fertilized. And so the male has to deposit sperm inside or onto the female for the sperm to get into where the egg is and fertilize it. Uh, if you've ever eaten or been frying eggs, especially if you get eggs that are uh, from free range chickens, I guess is what they call those. Uh, every once in a while you probably crack open an egg and there's a bloody spot on the egg. That's where the embryo is. Already, it's a fertilized embryo right there. It's a little baby chick. Not yet, it doesn't look like a chicken, but it's... The other eggs have not been fertilized. So most of the eggs that we have aren't fertilized. Uh, but if you see one with a little bloody spot on it, it means that it has been fertilized. And that's a little embryo that's starting to grow. And if you worm wood, uh, warm it up, it would actually eventually hatch out. It's a little bit late now that you've cracked the egg open. But, uh, so those were the parts of the uh, brain that we talked about before. Now the process of reproduction and raising it, uh, in some birds, mama does it all, and dad's job is maybe just to chase off predators. Uh, in some birds, mom and dad do both take turns setting on the nest. 
to keep it warm. Uh, it just depends on what species it is. Like we talked about the uh, penguin, mom lays the egg and, uh, and then dad <laughs> holds it on its feet with its belly flap, uh, flap over the top of it to keep it warm and he's incubating the egg uh, until mom returns. Um, some of them, uh, like we have some birds that come around our yard where mom and dad are both responsible for building the nest. And I think there's a, what is it, I think it's the weaver bird is one where dad makes the whole nest and then attracts a male, a female, and, uh, and then they use the nest. So, you know, there's many different ways that God created. Some build their nests in trees, uh, some build them in rocky cliffs, uh, some birds have their nests on the ground. Um, we have a, a bird around here called the killdeer. Uh, kind of has, uh, you'll often see, you can see killdeer more at, like in the late afternoon, early evening is when you see them. And they're often on the, they're, they're on the ground because they nest on the ground. And, and they're the bird that if you've ever kind of chased after them, they will often uh, run along the ground and kind of drag one wing to one side, make it look like they're injured. And the whole point of that is if they look injured, then the predator will chase after them, hoping to catch them, and well, they always just stay a little bit farther ahead, and they just lead the predator out far enough away where they're not going to be a threat, and then, and then they just take off and fly back to their nest. So, uh, you know, what they do and how they do it is just different from one bird to the next. God's made, made them with a whole variety of ways that they function. But the courtship is, is usually for the male is attracted, attracting a mate, and males will fight with each other for a mate. Strongest, strongest usually survive, not always that way, but quite often. Okay, so now let's talk about the little chicks that will hatch out. We have some birds, uh, they call them altricia chicks. These are the ones when they, um, like the picture shows right here, they have a very short incubation time. In other words, from the time the birds mate till the time and the egg left and make an egg till it hatches out is not going to be very long. But the birds come out very immature, uh, usually like lacking feathers, their eyes aren't even open, um, and all they know how to do is stick their little mouths up in the air when they hear mom come back. Uh, and mom just drops food into their mouth. And they then, you know, the mom is, is clearly responsible for everything about their their uh, survival and growth. Uh, so these hatchlings are really not well developed at all. If they fall out of it, get knocked out of the nest, you know, they're not going to survive. They're just food for cats or whatever other wild animal that comes along. Um, then we have what are called the precocial chicks. Have you talked about somebody being called precocial? That means they act older than they really are. Uh, like baby, uh, baby chicks, uh, but uh, baby ducklings, uh, as soon as they hatch out, they can start running around. They already, they hatch out with, uh, with feathers. They're not the, the adult feathers. They, they, they look almost like they have hair on them. Uh, but <coughs> they know how to swim. Their eyes are open. Uh, they know how to feed, uh, and mom will just often just take them, show them how to eat, and, and take them to places where they can't eat, but they learn how to eat almost immediately on their own. If you buy, uh, for instance, if you were um, on a farm, I guess you could even, uh, if some of the people around, I think, uh, have buy little baby chicks each year, you can it used to be, this is the part I thought was a little interesting, but the way they used to sell chicks is you could order your chicks, they'd come in a box, 
a special kind of box. It usually weren't, the box wasn't very deep, but big and round. And these little chicks would be on the inside, have little tiny holes in it so they free. And uh, they, you'd, you'd order them and they'd come in the mail. And your postman would deliver your chicks to your house. You're dismissed.